initially tour it, we'll look at and explore the role of the trail arm, or to be very precise, the movements the wrist, elbow, shoulder moves through throughout swing. So in my case, the trail arm being the right arm. So of all the segments we have within human movement, foot and ankle, cervical spine, the neck, the jaw, the ribcage, the pelvis, possibly the most influential segment we have on how all other segments move and interact and behave and swing is really how we move through that right arm or trail arm. So for sure, the cervical spine is vital for really how rotation is produced. Really, the feet and ankles are absolutely critical for how we move through swing. For example, how the ribcage and pelvis interact can be very influential on distance. But from a pure movement relevance and a movement hierarchy, how the trail arm moves or how the right arm moves has possibly the biggest and most significant influence on how all other segments adapt and behave in swing. So really given some references we can look to explore within the golf swing through the tutorial. So when we look at the trail wrist or the right wrist, typically the trail wrist will go through two movements through backswing. We have flex and extension and we have ulna and radial deviation. So just looking really at the ranges that we have available through that wrist, typically in most orthopedic or very normative samples, we have around about kind of 90 degrees of wrist flexion and somewhat close to about 70 of wrist extension. So that's very variable, obviously depending on bone configuration, tissue types, and the ranges we have. But typically for, for most of us, around about 90 degrees of wrist flexion and about 70 degrees of wrist extension. And then we're looking at the wrist, we have around about 25 degrees of radial deviation or kind of thumbs up and somewhat much closer to kind of 70 degrees of ulnar deviation. And that's many down once more to the bone configuration and the joint architecture we have around the wrist and also the length of the radius bone relative to the length of the ulnar bone and really where the kind of head of the radius sits in relation to the head of the ulnar relative to the wrist. So the radial head is much longer and closer into the hand which is why we have more range this way into ulnar deviation and less range or thumbs up into radial deviation. So as far as how that wrist moves in backswing, typically the real movement to try and avoid or certainly really be aware of moving excessively is lots of wrist extension. So from a pain observation and also from a real significance on how other segments adapt and behave, typically when we have more extension relative to the amount of radial deviation produced, that can have a significant influence on then how the elbow moves, how the shoulder moves, and then on a much more global discussion, how the ribcage and spine moves, and then really how that then connects and how the pelvis moves, and then finally, really what relationship that then has as far as any imbalances and adaptations that may then start to display through lower limb, foot and ankle. So when looking at the real story of movement, in essence, how the hands and wrists move through swing, actually then connect back to and really have a strong association then to why we see ground reaction forces display in the way that they do. So to really understand some of the ground reaction force data, we have to really look and explore and really be a lot more precise to understand how the wrist moves and what the influence it can then have on ground reaction force data. And that's actually something that we'll look at and explore in a future tutorial. So as far as how the wrist moves in back swing, from an anatomical observation, what we're looking to achieve and produce in that initial movement is fairly equal amounts of wrist extension alongside radial deviation. What the wrist doesn't enjoy is in essence a dominance in one of those two directions. Typically, there'd be a more of a dominance and extension than we have in radial deviation because of the available ranges that we have. And really why that's so important, when the wrist goes into extension, all those bones at the back of the wrist, so scaphoid, lunate, hamate, capitat, all the bones at the back of the wrist can hugely get compressed. And that's one of the biggest and clearest reasons on wrist pain that we see in players when there's lots of compression or extension through that wrist. So a very healthy wrist in that initial moment would typically be equal amounts of radial deviation and extension through that wrist in backswing. Also, when the wrist goes into high levels of extension, that can really change and influence then how the elbow moves through back. And so typically, and this is very generic for sure, there's always exceptions to these movements, but typically with anatomy, when the wrist goes into high levels of extension, the elbow then responds by moving into fairly prominent and fairly evident amounts of flexion. So almost that very kind of cross pattern we have 
when the wrist extends, the elbow can then start to move into high volumes and excessive amounts of flexion. When the elbow goes into flexion, that then really changes intrinsically how the shoulder joint moves, or to be very precise, how the humeral head or the top of the long humerus bone here interacts and moves within the shoulder joint. So when the wrist goes into high levels of extension, alongside the elbow responding by moving into high levels of flexion, the humeral head then typically gets pushed forwards. So when the humeral head goes forwards, often what can then happen with the scapula at the back, the scapula can then elevate and upwardly rotate or engulf coaching understanding, in essence, disconnect off that rib cage through back soon. So one of the most typical imbalances we see when there's lots of wrist extension and lots of elbow flexion, the humeral head goes forward, it elevates and moves up, the scapula then starts to move off the rib cage and that can then hugely change and really influence then how the rib cage and spine moves, equally so then how the pelvis adapts and then finally, which we'll go into in more precise feedback in a future tutorial, then really how the foot and ankle adapts and interacts with the floor, which is why then we see the ground reaction forces that we do. So going back to really that kind of wrist movement once again, really it's being aware of increasing or moving into excessive extension, but being very actively aware and being very overtly aware of the wrist moving into that slight radial position. So a reference I try and give people is whatever shape you have in that wristed address from a, an extended position. As you move through that initial phase in backswing, avoid that shape and wrist changing or increasing in that initial phase, almost back to that kind of club parallel or half back, depending on what definition one wishes to use. It. So the kind of guide we give being is the wrist moves into backswing, as it moves kind of thumb up onto radial deviation, we avoid that wrist changing shape or moving more into extension through back soon. Equally so, then actually look and really watch true shoulder rotations in golf. So shoulder rotation, certainly in a very colloquial way, is often be described as this in golf. That's actually more the spine movement and the rib cage movement. Shoulder rotation in golf is actually more these movements, and these are the very relevant ones we have when looking at shoulder anatomy and certainly shoulder biomechanics within the golf swing. So from the face-on view, as the kind of wrist moves into radial deviation and we avoid wrist extension, the reference that I try and encourage people to use is how the wrist then rotates past the elbow. So the idea of how do we produce external shoulder rotation is really achieved through the wrist rotating past and around the elbow. Typically in a very common imbalance we see is when the elbow leads the shoulder, so this shoulder then actually gets pushed into internal or medial rotation depend on the reference system that you use. So real good shoulder external rotation is produced when the wrist in essence rotates around and moves past the elbow in that first move. So just to really finish off that kind of initial reference that I use in that initial phase in backswing, encouraging radial deviation through the wrist, really avoiding extension and actively allowing the hand and wrist to rotate past the elbow, so in essence from the face on moves you'll see through this tutorial how the bicep remains facing forwards, so the medial, the inside part of the arm is very visible. Now there's many imbalances and adaptations for sure we can discuss, but perhaps the most relevant and the most prevalent one would be more that way, where the bicep then starts to move in towards the rib cage, the medial part of the arm becomes covered and invisible, the elbow has gone past the wrist, and the wrist then has excessive amounts of extension, which is why then the shoulder elevates and the scapula disconnects and moves off the rib cage. Looking at it from a target line view then, the final reference I kind of use and add on, and one of my real favorite ones to really explain kind of scapula rib cage interaction movement through backswing in a very intuitive way through this tutorial today, that around about halfway back, how the elbow sits directly beneath the shoulder joint through that initial phase in backswing. So in very healthy trail arm, trail wrist movement in that initial phase in backswing, how the elbow sits directly beneath the shoulder in that initial phase through backswing. One of the more common imbalances we see is often then when the elbow moves behind the shoulder in response to that humeral head moving forwards. So as we move through top of backswing, once again, we're trying to really match up how much radial deviation 
is being produced alongside wrist extension. Now, typically that's when you can start to see then the wrist moving slightly more into extension because it's around about here, depending on the player and their concepts and their anatomy, where we almost kind of max out and really use the available radial deviation that we have. Then ironically, it's around about this point through backswing then, that as the wrist starts to extend, intrinsically through the forearm, we can then start to see some internal and intrinsic pronation through the arm. So actual hand and wrist anatomy we're gonna look at in a future tutorial and explain in a much more precise, refined way. But the way in which the kind of wrist joints move, they are three-dimensional joints. So when the wrist goes into extension and radial deviation, internally and intrinsically, the forearm will pronate. Equally so, when we go into ulnar deviation and flexion, we'll get supination or relative supination intrinsically through the arm. So it's around about that, just past that kind of half-back position when we almost max out and use the available bone structure or radial deviation that we have, you may start to see slight more extensions to the wrist, which is why we'll often then start to see an intrinsic response through the forearm that it can then move slightly towards a pronated or into a pronated position. But again, looking at real good kind of trail arm or right arm function, references that I like to use at around about top of back soon once more, how the elbow still sits beneath the shoulder joint, or from that kind of face on position, the elbow remains beneath the wrist and the shoulder. Why is that so important? Well, from a force transfer or from a force application, the trail shoulder anatomically is almost the connection point between, let's call it the body and the arms, so a very, very kind of easy in a slightly dismissive um, way today, that we look at the kind of lower limb, through the pelvis, through the spine, the rib cage, what connects the arm to that system is essentially the trail shoulder. So for me, that's the anatomical link that we have through the golf swing. So all the energy we produce through lower limb, through pelvis, through rib cage has to migrate through that trail shoulder to then move along the arm into the hand and wrist for the human then to be able to apply the force to the handle, which is essentially then what creates and produces club head speed. So really from a force application discussion, the trail shoulder is possibly the most influential joint within human movement within the golf swing because all the energy we produce through here has to migrate through that trail shoulder to move down the arm to then allow us to apply those forces and stresses to the handle. So typically when we start to see the elbow moving behind the shoulder joint or the elbow elevating above the shoulder joint, the scapula then starts to disconnect and elevate and often then rotate away from that rib cage through backswing. The scapula is in many ways the connecting point between the arm and the rib cage. When we lose that connection, or which is often a phrase we use in golf coaching, when we lose that connection through that kind of trail scapula, trail shoulder, often all the energy we produce through here gets absorbed in this area and isn't then allowed to move along the arm into the hand and wrist and then to allow the golfer to apply those stresses in forces to the handle. So from a real force application discussion and really the anatomical connection to how much pressure, stress, and force we can apply to the handle, really the right shoulder position, to be very precise, the scapular position on that rib cage is vitally important. Certainly within movement, what controls how the shoulder moves is pretty much how the hands and wrists move. So really how the hands move through space, as you'll see through here, will then control how the shoulder responds and adapts to movement. So in essence, what we see and feel through here is just in response to how we move and how we behave through here. That's why that wrist movement at the beginning is so important. When we start seeing lots of extension, elbow behind us, humeral head elevates, the scapula disconnects. In essence, that anatomical connection we have between the arms and the body becomes really then quite compromised and in many ways makes it very challenging to then really apply all the forces we produce beautifully through the lower limb pelvis rib cage, then into the club in downswing. Then looking at downswing as we start in transition, the reference I use once again is that around about kind of, call it halfway down or somewhere for those that are more familiar say with the kind of Morad approach, kind of P5 and a half in some ways. So somewhere between kind of P5 and P6, 
that around about kind of halfway down, how the elbow once more sits directly or vertically beneath the shoulder joint. That once again puts that scapula in a very connected, very secure, very robust position to still once more allow rotation to happen whilst keeping that connection through that trail arm and rib cage as we rotate to approach into impact. So one of the real common imbalances we see is when the elbow gets behind the rib cage, that makes it very challenging then to really apply good force into that handle and certainly encourage good rotation as we approach impact when the arm or the shoulder blade be very precise is then disconnected off that rib cage. So alongside that movement in transition, one of the real possibly biggest contributors to the actual wrist pain and wrist injury is when we get that real increase in wrist extension in transition. Now, I know the lead wrist has had much attention in recent times. The biggest contributor to trail wrist pain, and to be very precise, the most relevant or most typical point in time to when we get trail wrist pain is actually in transition. Lead wrist can often be a little bit more through and post impact because of the range of the lead wrist can move through as we approach and move through impact. But typically when there's trail wrist pain, is often what it goes through in that transition phase, which is then it, what exposes the joints and the tissues to the movements and tolerances they simply can't absorb and tolerate. The very common one we see with the movement is then when the wrist moves into high levels of extension in transition alongside radial deviation, an area such as the scaphoid, the lunate, can then get really compressed alongside all those connective tissues that run through that medial part of the arm, which then get really exposed to high levels of length and load. So as we start down swing, it's really avoiding any change in extension, elbow underneath shoulder joint, and then really from the face on view, it's encouraging and allowing the elbow to get to the hip before the wrist. So the very common movement we often see is when the hand or wrist gets to the hip before the elbow. Again, it's when we've lost that connection through that trail arm. So a very connected, very matched scapula to rib cage would be, but from the face on view, the medial part of the, the elbow, so to be very precise, the epicondyle, which is the, the kind of funny bone in some ways inside the elbow, would be in line or in front of that hip joint before the wrist. So therefore that very connected trail arm that we have can then maintain that shape and maintain that connection as we rotate through and post impact, rather than when the elbow gets behind us, the wrist gets to the hip before the elbow, we then start to see that disconnection and that separation in that trail arm through impact. And invariably, whatever we see through here, through that trail arm, is simply in response to and an adaptation to often how we move in transition and really how we move in transition really just relates back to and connects really back to how we move in that first phase in backswing. Let's then look at this through the use of the 3D animation as well. So you'll see the trail arm here on display and we have two values in the real time. Now we have the trail wrist flexing extension and the one beneath the trail shoulder flexing extension. So shoulder flexion essentially when the arm or hand lifts vertically directly above you and then extension when the arm then returns back down to the side. So really, how do we kind of use those references that we've just discussed and see that in a more animated 3D world with some numerical feedback to then support and reinforce the discussion currently around how that right arm moves. So if we move through backswing. So you'll see initially the values are displaying that trail wrist, so two degrees of extension, so really minimal amounts of extension that trail wrist at address and the shoulder flexion value of 34 degrees because the arm is essentially sitting slightly forwards or the rib cage is bending forwards more than the humerus at address. So that's where that flexion value comes from. If the humerus was absolutely parallel to the rib cage, it would be a zero value. So the reason why there is a flexion value is essentially the arm is vertical relative to the forward bend of the rib cage. So if we now play this person back into essentially that kind of half three quarter back position. So you'll see around about here how there's almost no change in the flexion value around that trail shoulder. So really how well down the scapula sat, how well down and depressed the humeral head sits. So the minimal elevation or movement upwards of that right shoulder and right scapula through back. So it's a really highlighted hopefully very well through the numerical feedback in this part of the tutorial, really how well the right shoulder sits down, in essence what golf coaches then call connection. So equally when someone moves really well around that wrist and shoulder, if we look at it now just through the arm position, you'll see 
how wonderfully well the elbow sits directly beneath the shoulder around about that kind of position you see on the screen here. And to be even more precise now, if we look at the humerus in isolation, again, how vertical that humeral bone or the humerus bone, I should say, sorry, hangs vertically through that position in space. So the elbow sits directly beneath the humeral head around about that point in time. Equally, if we go back to the start position value, you'll see there's only really a small you know, 15 degree change, I think it was we looked at there, in that wrist extension. So minimal activity around that wrist extension in that initial phase in backswing. Looking now at how the arm moves through downswing and as it approaches impact, again, using a very similar stage in downswing as a reference, if we isolate and look at the arm independently, once more you'll see how the elbow sits closely beneath or underneath the humeral head at this stage in downswing. So in essence, the, the humerus is hanging almost vertically. Once more, we now look at where the club is as it approaches impact. Again, how vertical the humerus is at impact. So the elbow sits directly beneath the humeral head at impact. And then just as we move through impact, again, the minimal or if any increase in space between the side of the rib cage and the humerus as they move through impact. So just using a very small circle there is a visual guide, how there's minimal separation or movement away from the rib cage of that right arm as they move during in post impact. So essentially what golf coaches rightly refer to as a form of connection. So looking at that right arm, of all the segments we have within the golf swing, clearly and by far the most important and most influential on how all other segments adapt and behave. So just to go through almost that kind of slight reference system once more, in that initial phase in backswing, it's actively encouraging radial deviation and really actively avoiding excessive extension. Around about half back, so from the face on position, wrist has moved past the elbow, bicep somewhat facing forwards, the medial part of the arm visible. From the target line view, we would then have elbow under shoulder joint. Top of back swing once more, elbow beneath shoulder. Face on position, elbow sits beneath wrist and shoulder. As we start down in transition, it's avoiding that excessive extension with radial deviation, which is really just awful on every level for how the, essentially wrist health and then how the wrist responds from an anatomical observation. Around about half down, elbow once more beneath the shoulder joint. So therefore, from the face on position, the elbow gets to the hip before the wrist, keeping that connection through that kind of upper arm tricep rib cage as we start to then rotate through impact we can maintain that connection through that trail arm. And really, why is that trail arm so important? Really for those two main reasons. The right shoulder is the anatomical connection between essentially the body and the hands and arms. So all the energy we produce through lower limbs, through pelvis or rib cage, has to migrate through that shoulder to then be allowed to move down the hand into the club head to then produce those stresses and forces that we need. And then secondly, really how the arm and shoulder and wrist move through backswing is often then what causes and creates their many imbalances through other segments in swing, which is often then why we get the ground reaction forces display the way they do. Perhaps the R within ground reaction force could actually stand for right arm. So it could almost be ground right force, that how the right arm moves is often then why we see the ground reaction forces that we do.